Thank you. So welcome Primavera, welcome Clément. I'm going to introduce both of you very quickly. Primavera, you are a researcher, a legal researcher. You work at the CNRS and uh, Harvard around the decentralized technologies and uh, specifically the blockchain. And you also are the co-founder of Backfeed, which is a decentralized governance system running on the blockchain. And Clément, you are the founder of uh, Cell Labs, which is an ecos innovation ecosystem facilitator who specifically focuses on uh, uh, blockchain technologies. So we are here today uh, to um, make some kind of an extension of the blockchain track from yesterday uh, in the context of this organization and governance um, track that we are in today, specifically to understand the impact that blockchain can have on organizations and um, enabling this new kind of organization that we hear a lot about uh, these past few days, which are DAOs, Decentralized Autonomous Organization. So I will start with a very simple question that probably the majority of the people in this room wonder, what is a DAO? <laughs> Primavera, do you want to start? Um, it's a difficult question, but uh, I think maybe the best way to explain it is through examples. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so, well, everybody knows obviously what is the blockchain and um, I assume everybody knows what are smart contracts, but if you don't... Uh, I'm not sure everybody knows what's yeah, a so smart contract. So a smart contract is not a contract and it's not really smart. Uh, it's basically just code deployed on the blockchain. So it's code that is running not on a centralized server, but runs in a decentralized manner on the blockchain. And this gives the particularity that in the same way as um, with Bitcoin, for instance, everybody always needs to validate the transactions, then when you deploy a software on the blockchains, everyone needs to agree about the execution of this code. So there is this guarantee of execution. And there is also the fact that once it has been deployed on the blockchain, the code cannot be modified. And therefore, it, it, it provides this transparency as to what is the code that is being executed and uh, this kind of incorruptibility. Now, when we move from a smart contract to a decentralized autonomous organization, basically, we just add one little element, which is we add a token. So. A decentralized autonomous organization is a more sophisticated version of a smart contract which provides a particular token which can be used for many different things. It can be used as a um, governance system or it can be used as um, something like equity or as shares or it can be used like as an access token. So, as a, as so by token it's a cryptocurrency, right? It's, it's kind of like Bitcoin, okay. yeah. So, in fact, Bitcoin is perhaps the best example of a decentralized autonomous organization where um, it, it creates this token and it creates an incentive for people to contribute to the organization by providing hashing power in order to help validate the transactions. And this token can then be used in order to benefit from the service of this organization, which is using the token in order to send Bitcoins on the Bitcoin networks. And then over time, there is a lot of new um, alternatives that have been created, and Ethereum is perhaps the most uh, relevant one today, which creates a general purpose platform for decentralized applications or for smart contracts, which makes it actually really easy to deploy decentralized applications on top of the blockchain. So um, in the same way, it's, it's just like a really similar uh, system. Ethereum provides tokens for people that are contributing resources in order to, on the one hand, validate the transaction, on the other hand, in order to um, compute and execute the software that is deployed on Ethereum. And this token that Ethereum provides then can be used in order to benefit from the service provided by the Ethereum network. Thank you. So if I want to explain what you just explained to my mother or my father, I just say, for instance, that it's an organization in which you replace human management by code and specifically uh, smart contracts and a, and, a, and a currency. I'm not sure she, w she would understand, but maybe that would be uh, quicker. Uh, thank you. Um, Clément, I would like to react to that and specifically maybe uh, uh, with a focus on a recent example that people that are enthusiastic about the blockchain hear a lot about these last days, which is uh, the DAO, the, because maybe it's the first major one, 
one of the first major ones. So some of you might remember from the introduction from uh, the Wish Fest yesterday when Arthur and Antonin were talking about this crazy crypto investment fund that just read, just uh, raised 120 million in Ether. So that's a huge participative decentralized investment fund. But is it really that? Is it more than that? Uh, Clément, you've been following a lot the construction of this new creature. So, no? Okay, so we move to the next question. Okay, so first of all, um, people at Slokit who are part of the uh, creation of the DO are sorry Sl for Slokit, for people who don't know Slokit. Yeah, sorry. So Slokit is composed by uh, people who were founder or co-founder uh, of the team of the Ethereum uh, blockchain. And uh, almost uh, two years ago, and now officially one year ago, they moved into applying the blockchain into IoT hardware and to build what Gav and a few others have called the Ethereum computer. And so uh, Stefan was supposed to be here. Unfortunately, he can't make it because of uh, the activity at the moment and the actuality. Uh, but uh, they wanted to say that they were uh, wishing to be here with you and uh, share some of the idea on the project they are working on because it relates with a lot of the things that you are doing here. That being said, um, Actually, what was the question? <laughs> what is the DAO? So the DAO is basically what Prima is trying to explain. It's um, a way to have a company that can run by itself in the future. And at the moment, are using a human agent to be able to do uh, its um, um, acquisition of uh, proposal. So people can come to this uh, organization and they can propose a project that's related with what they are trying to do. Then they are, from the token that you describe, uh, able to vote yes or no into the proposal that are proposed to the organization themselves. And they can split, but we won't go into detail today. And uh, what happened after is that you have a community of people through this uh, blockchain mechanism that can push project forward to help with the community, first of all, of the project itself to move to the next step, but also for people to be independent and to provide services, companies, um, to uh, improve and implement the uh, goal of building this kind of Ethereum computer. And so to come back to your question, Slokid is trying to do this. They are trying to implement the blockchain with IoT. Uh, and some of the proof of concept that they've done are to apply it for at the moment uh, with a lock um, and to allow the lock to have advantages that you wouldn't have with regular technology and centralized mechanism. OK. Um, and so from what, uh, what I understood from what you said is that it's a way to pull together resources, financial, but not only, also project proposals from the community that wants to make blockchain projects happen together into a common pool. Um, but some some uh, feedback and criticism I have heard about this specific vehicle, the DAO, is that when you look at at least the financial part, uh, it's not so much different in the incentive than from a traditional investment fund in a way, in the sense that people uh, buy tokens like in a, like a pre-sale, like instead of uh, buying a product on Kickstarter, you buy tokens on pre-sale, and then you vote according to how much tokens you have and you get um, um, revenue back from it. Yeah. yeah, it's exactly this. But once again, the DAO, the DAO built by the uh, community that just raised uh, 150 this morning, I think, is not an investment fund. It's really important. It's a company which have some property of investing, but which have other property which are very important. And they are allowing people to build this kind of juridical or at least digital uh, organization to be able to do the thing that you would usually do with a crowdfunding campaign or with regular investment mechanism, but it's not an investment fund. Okay, it's not an investment fund, but it's still invest in projects. In yes, way. the same way that a lot of people who are here, I'm sure are investing a lot of their time, resource, ideas, even sometimes skills into building projects together. Uh, and the same way that when you are trying to push a project and this project is going to create a service or device or product, then you will be getting some feedback from it because you invest in these kind of things. Primavera, what's your thought, reaction, observation on DDAO specifically? Well, I think the DDAO is um, quite revolutionary um, in its uh, infrastructure in the sense that it is I guess it is the first general purpose framework for a uh, decentralized autonomous organization. Um, at the level of the governance, though, 
it is it is indeed quite uh, like it, it replicates a little bit of the legacy model in the sense that there is indeed uh, the shareholders, which are the people that have invested funds into this organization and that uh, have the right to actually engage into the governance. And then it also comes with uh, the curators, which are elected uh, individuals which have some uh, uh, well, which have the power to authorize and potentially to veto the funding on, s on specific proposals. So, in in a way, it is it is replicating an old model on a new infrastructure, and uh, this is this is an amazing uh, uh, step. This is this is extremely interesting. But indeed, um, in in the same way as we can look at it in, in correspondence with Bitcoin, which innovated and created like an, a revolutionary technology, which is the blockchain. But in the end, the Bitcoin model is actually highly replicating the traditional currency model. However, it did open the way to, or it, it opened the mind to thinking and for people to actually realize that everyone potentially could create their own money and uh, encode it or design it according to their own value systems. And so in the same way, the DAO, it replicates an old model, but it's also opening the way for uh, an, a whole new variety of decentralized autonomous organization, which can innovate on top of this and which can actually experiment with new di uh, different governance model, which might be uh, maybe that could not be conceived before because we didn't have this decentralized infrastructure, which can be more decentralized or like distributed and collaborative. So at the moment, it is it is it is one instance, and uh, I think the interesting thing is actually to see how this will evolve and uh, what are the different varieties of DAOs that will um, emerge from this. Clément, what do you think would be the like the evolution of uh, of the DAO? Like you were talking to me about the fact that they are thinking about new features, new functionalities, and what will be the first pr concrete project that, that you see coming out of it? So to answer to your question, to come back with what Prima was saying, that Bitcoin in some way could be considered as a, a DAO by itself because it's a service that provides financial means for people to be able to share money, but it's not been owned by anyone, it's not been governed by anyone, you have different mechanisms to do it, but that's a very interesting model. The same way that people like uh, Vitaly, Gav, Jeff and others who have been building the Ethereum platform and now all the other people in the communities and new blockchain uh, so that there was some limitation with Bitcoin to implement the goal and the vision that people had with this kind of technology. They were already planning to build this kind of DO. And actually people like Vitalik Buterin uh, wrote a great deal about the DO concept. People like Primera Vera pushed a lot of great deal about this kind of concept. And so you have a lot of people. And my point is that it's just a continuity of the vision and the work of a lot of people uh, have been working on for many years. So now the DO by itself is nothing new. It's just the logical and continuous evolution of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a few other projects. And so what it means is that the current version of the DO um, is sometimes misunderstood, but it's probably because it's a very new project. Um, and the uh, Slucky team, for example, has been doing an amazing job in doing education. You can go online on YouTube. They've been doing some AMA videos, and you can go online with the uh, Slack uh, channel. They have 5,000 people now who are working on these kind of things. And educate yourself with this kind of thing, which is something I really uh, I recommend. Why is it important? It is important because the current state of the DO, which was uh, launched and raising a lot of money, by the way, 150 million is a lot of money for you and me, but it's nothing in terms of experiment and innovation. And you have billions who are being spent every year in doing failing experiment technology that are pretty much useless. Um, so that's also something to consider about the market cap and all this kind of bullshit. Um, the second thing is, so to answer to your question, the current model is not really a DO. It's DAO is supposed to be decentralized autonomous organization. It's as uh, Prima say, it's an organization structure that allows to do things that are not possible with the current infrastructure that we have. But it cannot do all the things that you hear in the press at the moment. What will happen is that over the time that the DAO is being built and people give proposals and they implement new um, function um, into the code, then the code will be able to mature itself it will be able to uh, evolve with um, a mechanic of voting about what uh, will be implemented and no. And so you have some kind of what Prima was talking earlier, uh, yesterday actually, I think about this kind of uh, analogy with biology. You clearly have codes, programs that are getting more and more complex, that are getting more and more um, 
involved in our everyday life in governance. Uh, for example, in the big banking system, uh, a lot of the uh, requests that are being asked are being done by algorithm already. And so the blockchain is interesting, but when you step out a little bit, the blockchain becomes interesting because it's going to evolve and because other technology are also evolving in machine learning, in AI, in a new way of programming. The second thing is from an education standpoint, more and more people will be able to play with this kind of smart contract concept like script because you will have the means and the understanding to be able to do this kind of things. And so that's why it's interesting in terms of project because once again, it's not like a coup d'etat. It's a community project and a lot of people in the room are working in these communities. It's a technology that's evolving. It's an experiment, very important. The DAO is an experiment and we will see more and more DAO, as you were saying, that are going to come online. And then it will be, uh, let's see what happens with it. Thank you. Wh what are the, um, you two, the first uh, proposals that you see coming out of the DAO? And are you going to submit proposals, the two of you? Um, well, for me, the like as to the DAO has two functions. One is indeed it is like this kind of pool of resources which can be used in order to invest into project that probably will have a really hard time to raise money otherwise. Um, and so I think there will be a lot of those uh, people or like ideas that can be submitted in order to get enough funds to actually experiment with this. And then the other uh, trend, I guess, of um, proposal that. Um, that actually have been invited uh, to be submitted uh, for the DAO is actually about how do you improve the DAO itself, right? Um, and I will say that at the moment, at least in my opinion, one big limitation of the current model of the DAO is that it is actually, regardless of whether it is a decentralized investment fund or uh, like however we want to call it, but the, the, the goal is actually to find a way to invest into specific project. But the way in which it works now is basically that whoever is investing uh, has a voice. So it's a really kind of market-driven approach, um, which I think most of our organization do not at all operate like this. Like you don't actually give the voice to the investor to decide strategically as to how the organization should evolve, but actually you need an internal governance structure. So I think that the, one of the, the main limitations today in this current model is that uh, we actually need to design an, a different uh, governance structure for the general model of a decentralized autonomous organization when decisions are not made by people that are putting money into it. Also because, especially as a, as a decentralized investment fund, it is extremely, like, this is a really difficult thing. And like, you can rely on the intelligence of the crowd, but you kind of need to coordinate this intelligence, like, especially when it is like sophisticated decisions. So just relying on the number of tokens can create like really difficult decision making without an actual governance structure. So um, it is actually one of the proposals that uh, we will submit is to actually create a decentralized governance model which uh, uh, distinguish the monetary investment, which actually can provide returns of investment just like in the traditional model, but then elaborate an actual collaborative uh, business model or collaborative governance, which is based on how much people contribute to the organization. And then the influence within the organization is not dependent on the amount of money that one have in has invested into it, but is dependent on the value as perceived by the other members of the organization that everyone has put into it. So basically what you want to do is like kind of adding a social layer on top of the, of the tech layer that is a that is the blockchain uh, and the EOS? Yeah, th the idea is like, well, the, the, way, the way we frame is that uh, currently you have a decentralized autonomous organization and the autonomy lies in the fact that your contribution are basically monetary contribution, which can really easily be assessed by a machine, by a computer. So you don't need human judgment to assess my contributions. We actually want to shift this towards a more collaborative approach to create those decentralized collaborative organizations, which actually are based on human judgment and human values and where the governance and the decision making is actually based on the alignment of values as opposed to the economic uh, investment. Yeah, this is interesting, and I guess this is very challenging because uh, if you s if you look at like what we have today as a DAO, all the um, like all the people who are involved, their contribution is in a way something that is uh, very easy to quantify and to measure. 
So in the Bitcoin or Ethereum network, it's mostly the computing power that you provide to, to run the network. Uh, on the DAO, it's the funds, like the Ether, you, you send to it so it can uh, raise money for, uh, for the project. But what you're talking about is like uh, moving from this type of contribution to more qualitative uh, value, like human-based interaction. Yeah, basically. so we, we like with, with Backfeed, we call this the proof of value. So you have the proof of work, which is calculated the amount of hashing power. You have, for instance, in Lazus, you have the proof of movement, which is also using computer to calculate how much you've been moving in, in as a contribution to the, to the, to the ride-sharing network. And what we're providing is proof of value, which is actually something that depends on the value system of people and that requires human and subjective judgment. Clément, do you want to react on this? Uh, or not? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, uh, I'm listening. Um, so maybe I'm going to be insisting, but um, it's really important to have an understanding that the concept is uh, growing. The reality is still going to take a lot of time. And that's why a proposal like uh, what Backfeed is doing and the work you are doing is very important. Um, the other thing is, as you said, is um, including human judgment into something that's supposed to be mechanical, mathematical, I think is very hard and I don't see it coming for some time. And actually people like uh, Stefan Tual would tell you that actually the DAO is a way of waiting for a strong AI. So for people who are familiar with this kind of things, artificial intelligence, it's still a long way. Uh, we get into this kind of things. But what's interesting with it is uh, the um, hybrid model. So first of all, the DAO is useless or there is no use for it if it doesn't apply for allowing people with project and idea to be able to build them, to be able to have the fund to do it, which is great, but more importantly, for them to be able to connect with people who have the skills, the tools, and the resource, intellectual resource, to try to be able to do it. The second thing is not to be going into um, what we would call like a bullshit proposal, which are going to flood the ecosystem very quickly. And that's a big problem. How do you make the separation between both when you are trying to do like uh, algorithm and computing to do it? And there is so much variable that they are not able to do it at the moment. And then you have maybe some uh, model that will be interesting to see uh, as um, like a Amazon Turk mechanism. So um, Christoph was saying that uh, there is someone apparently in Japan who has been proposing to be get p to be paid in token. Um, uh, for the number of hours that he's providing. So that's interesting because you have a way of using the old way of doing, which is I uh, uh, get paid for X, uh, for X hour. And they are using and moving from fiat to cryptocurrency, but also with smart contracts that allow you to have this kind of traceability. And so something we talked about earlier is um, the blockchain is interesting, but when you take it alone, it's not really interesting. There is a lot of interesting things that are being built, but in terms of application, we are not here yet. Why is it interesting? Why is it important? Is that it's not necessarily the security aspect of the technology. It's not necessarily the decentralizing aspect of it and everything is going to be well and perfect in the world. It's more about the autonomy of the information itself. So I know that a lot of people in the sharing economy are working about how do you allow information identification system for people to move from services to services. And the DAO, I think, is or could have this kind of uh, experimental way of allowing people not to restart from zero for this brick of project to be able to get funding but also to have transparency with what they are doing which is a big problem at the moment in terms of investment a lot of the money is just being throw away with very stupid way of managing things, of allowing people to be able to start from, um, uh, not from restarting from zero, but on the shoulder of people who've been uh, so doing some interesting things. Uh, so in terms of sharing economy, I think it's really interesting because um, they are trying to push the frontier with this kind of thing. We don't really know where we are going. There is some risk, but uh, um, uh, the uh, output that will potentially come out of it will be uh, tremendous. Um. Thank you, both of you. I think that there is a question that probably a lot of people are still um, uh, having a hard time with, which is like, what is, if I want to make it very, very simple, what is like the, the, the killer app of the DAO in the sense that, okay, what kind of, of mission and organization uh, would it serve best? Because if you, 
like for instance for um, for a small uh, company or a small organization where there is already trust and the people are working well together it doesn't seem to add so much added value to add an, an coordination mechanism on the blockchain this is kind of what uh, francesca was mentioning about uh, the wish experiment so is the purpose of these daos or dcos to be able to uh, uh, put at scale coordination between a large number of people for a certain kind of mission on which they're aligned can it work with uh, more concrete uh, physical activities like i don't know manufacturing transportation uh, all of that how do you see like the where would be the best possible applications i think it's not really about according to the sector but rather according to the typology um i, I would say that it's mostly for this kind of like open source style organization in which you have you have a mission and then you have an open-ended uh, number of contributors that can come and go and in which you don't have like you don't you can have like some kind of meritocracy as it goes but you don't want to have a formalized structure because you actually want to incentivize people to come and to contribute where the the contribution will actually lead to a reward so in this case it can be tokens or it can be influence etc so it's more about a new way of organizing it's a, it's a new organizational structure if you like but you can apply it probably to to anything in which it makes sense to deploy such a kind of uh, organizational structure okay. clement yeah so um i don't think there is any killer app and uh, there is no killer app in the blockchain technology and there is no killer app actually with most technology it's the combination of multiple technology that brings something meaningful and useful um, in terms of blockchain itself, there is a lot of people working on a lot of different proposals, and I think the DO, at least, I hope the um, the best output of the DO model will be not to have competition between different project proposals, but actually, at the contrary, to create a network between all the different projects, so they don't have once again to have to restart from zero. Um, but you have very interesting projects. You have, for example, Thomas, who is working on a Mobotic, which is one of the two proposals with Slurkit, are, are uh, giving um, uh, the idea of applying the blockchain for car sharing system, and they've been building their own vehicle. They are between France and Romania at the moment, and I highly encourage you to have a look at it. We have people like in the audience, like Riel, who are working on DAISY, applying blockchain with energy. I know that you have people who are working also with different groups sort of other world uh, into these kind of things. And we have a lot of people who are trying to push the blockchain outside of just financial and radical application, but into something more maybe exciting, like what happens if you put it in biology, in space, in uh, education, there's a lot of things that are interesting. And so to come back to your question, um, Blockchain is interesting. If you take it alone, it's not really interesting at the moment. In terms of governance, there's a lot of work to be done. And so the only thing that you can hope for is how do you focus on one project, one group of people, execute something, produce something, and then you have all this kind of education and accompaniment that are needed for the DAO to be able to do something meaningful with it. And then for them not to be in competition, but to be able to collaborate with each other. And they have the tools, or the tools are slowly coming online to be able to allow this kind of thing. And that's why it's interesting. So in the competition, it's a network of projects. Okay, thanks. Um, la maybe la last question. Um, also, maybe starting with you, Primavera. So you're, can I say you're a lawyer or you're a legal researcher? Legal researcher. You're a legal researcher. Anyway, you know about law. Uh, if, like, the DAO does something wrong, how do I sue the DAO? Who do I sue? Well, uh, good luck. <laughs> But actually, not really, because, uh, I mean, we, so, I don't know, the answer is I don't know. But uh, we actually have done some research about this with, um, with the Koala organization, and we're trying to understand, indeed, what could be the legal status of a DAO. And uh, it's actually quite complicated, because, of course, it is an organization that does not exist, it's not recognized by the legal system, so you cannot really sue it. But on the other hand, you know, the, the law is actually always relying on this notion of uh, the closest available person. And so it's, it's actually dangerous in some way to be a member of a DIO when, when the DIO does not have a legal entity. Because, you know, you have the concept of like general partnership, for instance, which does not have uh, limited liability. So this means that potentially, I mean, this, this is completely speculative because it has not been tested at all. But but possibly it could be held that everyone that participates as a member to the DAO is 
in a general partnership and therefore they are all jointly liable to what the DAO has done. So in this way, actually, non-incorporating the DAO can actually create liability to the members, whereas incorporating the DAO is then providing, you can incorporate it as a company or as a non-profit or whatever, then you are providing a legal personality to the DAO, but then obviously it becomes also more easy to sue the DAO. So, I mean, I have no idea, but this is definitely a really gray area of the law. Thank you. Uh, I think we need to close now. Any last word for somebody who wants to join and contribute to this experiment? Clement? You mean to ask questions to the public? No, no, no. To, to like somebody wants to, is interested in uh, the DAO, oh, yeah, wants sure. to follow, wha what should I do? Yeah, so um, once again, education is the best way to play with this kind of thing and to uh, um, filter the uh, noise uh, that you are going to hear more and more in the media. Uh, so the best way is to go on the DAO. The Hub, if I'm not mistaken, uh, just put the DAO up. You will have the forum where you have a lot of discussion. You have thousands of people who are working, proposing, um, and uh, debating about what to do with it. Then you have to, uh, if you want to play with it, also get familiar with Ethereum. And by the way, you are lucky because since a few months ago now, you are able to download the client on your computer, either it's a Mac, PC, uh, or Linux uh, version. And from there, you can also play with the uh, Ether. And so buying a lot of money is just useless. Yeah. And we see the speculation hype that's going through yeah. it. And uh, we'll see where it goes. But uh, it's not very healthy, I think. But what is interesting and healthy is to be able to play with this technology, download the uh, app, to be able to go through all the docu documentation that Ethereum has been doing, and just make your own mind. And uh, if you like it, uh, just uh, play with it. And if you don't like it, there is a lot of other things in the world to do and to play with. And it only takes 10 hours to download the, the Ethereum blockchain, which is way better than Bitcoin. So. A bit less. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and um, see you at the Q&A session on the terrace if you want to continue the conversation with uh, Primavera and Clement. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>